A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim I start in the name of Allah, the Beneficent and the Merciful I seek salvation from Shaitan the Accursed My dearest viewers, my children, my brothers and sisters and my elders from across the world Assalamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh May the peace, blessings and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you I would like to thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Ramadan show exclusively here on Imam Hussain TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Inshallah, today we will go through more topics to be your one-stop shop for this holy month. I would like to humbly request you to please send in your videos and your pictures from wherever you are in the world so we can see how you're preparing your day-to-day -day lives for this holy month. Also, please don't forget to join us on Twitter using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. Don't forget to join us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, inshallah, this program will be uploaded onto there tomorrow. Before proceeding on to the show, I just wanted to impart a quote, a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, where he says, do not drive away your blessings through your own ungratefulness. Inshallah, in this show, we shall elaborate further. But this is a very true saying where if we don't be thankful for Allah and for his mercies that he's bestowed upon us, we can drive away the bounties that are heading our way. Today's episode of Spiritual Refinement, I want to talk about something, an emotion, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is very basic yet so important, and that is the gift of gratefulness. Being able to feel and express gratitude is one of the most profound yet simplistic gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. The reason why it's so beneficial is because it allows us to make connections. The reason why it's so simple is that it doesn't require any special knowledge, any special skills, any special equipment or preparation. Anyone at any time can access this gift of thankfulness. However, we find that most of us fall short of this, especially when it comes to expressing our thank thankfulness and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we can make a start on this. Improvement has to start from somewhere. Just practice and notice a blessing and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. You see, it doesn't take a lot to sit down and contemplate, but yet we don't find the time to do it. And when we f reflect and contemplate, we can pick up on these very, very small blessings that we have in our lives and put them together. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for each and every one of those. If you can't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of them, thank you for one, one that you no normally don't think about or thank for. One of the reasons why gratitude is so beneficial is because it improves interrelationships, whether interpersonal or with our Creator. When we're able to feel and express gratitude for Allah's blessings, affection grows between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also vice versa, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, the closer you come to me, the closer I'll come to you. But the personal benefits are also great. You see, a thankful heart remains a contented, content heart. Even in times and circumstances of hardship, we always have much to appreciate. When we acknowledge this, our burdens become more easier to bear. Imam Sadiq salam has said, With every breath you take, a thanksgiving is incumbent upon you. Indeed, a thousand thanks more. The lowest level of gratitude is to see that the blessing comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, irrespective of the cause for it and without the heart being attached to that cause. It consists of being satisfied with what is given. It means not disobeying him with regard to his blessings or opposing him in any of his commandments and prohibitions because of his blessing. Our breathing comes without thought and yet each breath is a blessing. Our heart continues to beat without any voluntary control. It's a blessing. 
You see, the struggle for breath is an agony which we're usually spared thousands upon thousands of times without thinking. It is the gift of breath that is taken from us and then we die. Breath is the ultimate beginning of life. When a newborn or a baby is born, the first thing they do is to cry, to take a gasp of air. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the breathing and we continue this process until we die without even thinking about it. And we never think about thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every breath we have, with every breath we take. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, very few of my servants are grateful. You see, expressing gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in itself a great form of worship. At the minimum, gratitude should be a basic part of our daily prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us that if we're grateful, our blessings will increase. And not only is this true about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but life in general. When you're thankful towards people around you, their affection towards you grows. It is important to note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of our gratitude, nor does he feel hurt by our ingratitude. You see, our gratitude enriches us as individuals. Lady Zainab, peace and blessings be upon her, has said a very valuable lesson or has set a very valuable lesson for us in patience, in gratitude, when she says, I have not seen anything but the beauty of God. Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam have always expressed thankfulness and gratitude despite so many hardships and difficulties. So finally, I want to leave you with these few thoughts and something for you to ponder over and reflect over because after all, this is why we're here, to be the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So next time you are in a situation where you feel ungrateful, think about these things. Be thankful that you already don't have something that you desire. If you did, what would there be to look forward to? Be thankful when you don't know something for it gives you the opportunity to learn. Be thankful for the difficult times. During those times you grow as a person. Be thankful for your limitations because they give you the opportunity for improvement. Be thankful for every new challenge because that challenge will allow you to build your strength and character. Be thankful for your mistakes, for those mistakes will teach you a lesson. Be thankful for when you're tired and weary because it means you've made a difference. Gratitude can turn negativity into a positive. Find a way to be thankful and especially when you're in trouble, find a way to be thankful and have gratitude because you will see those negatives and those, those bad experiences will actually become something positive. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, O people, surely the month of God has approached you, the month which in the eyes of Allah is the most virtuous of the months. Its days are the best of days and its nights are the best of nights, and its moments the best of moments. Today, as we look around the world and we look at different places to see how they prepare themselves for the month of Ramadan, I want to take us to a city which is called Karachi in the country of Pakistan. Karachi is infamous for so many reasons. Firstly, in the Shia world, for the targeted killings of Shias within the city, we hear stories of Professor Sipta Jafar, who was killed, who is a very famous Shia poet. The other reason why it's so famous is because it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest city within Pakistan itself. And number three, it's very famous because it has such a diverse population, the very rich, the very poor, different religions such as Christianity, Islam, and other religions as well within the city. The Shias within the city are found in very small pockets. However, the Shias do form quite a large part of the population. There's specific areas such as Malir, Khurasan, 
and other areas such as Ancholi around Karachi, which are populated by Shia people. And therefore, the Shia people have very specific ways in which they prepare for this holy month. And there's a very strong sense of kinship and brotherhood because obviously they're isolated and targeted and therefore they galvanize and come together as a community. In Karachi, the people tend to get up and they work through the day. The hours of fasting are a lot smaller compared to places like Quetta, which is found in the north of Pakistan. Karachi at this time of the year is very, very hot. And therefore the people, if they're working in stalls, they tend to close them during the hottest parts of the afternoon and reopen them a bit later on in the evening when it's a bit cooler. When people come home from work, they tend to rest for a while. And then they have iftar, usually in gatherings, usually in the mosques. And in the mosques, they have things like recitation of the Quran, they have dua, they have majalis every single night. And people come together in their large communities in order to celebrate or to remember this holy month en masse as a congregation. Children are encouraged to fast and if they fast one or two days, they're rewarded with gifts and the elders praise them for doing this in preparation for older age. The people of Karachi get together for iftar and their largest meal is usually after the time of Maghrib. They have very, very light food at Maghrib and then after that, maybe an hour or two later, they get together in communities or in families and they eat together. They don't like eating in isolation. And they feed the poor as well. So they give the poor alms. They give the poor food and drink in, during this month so that they can also enjoy in the iftar. The government of Pakistan subsidizes things like oil, rice, flour during this month so that everyone can have the ability to cook even the most basic foods during this holy month. Inshallah, I pray, or I hope rather, that you send in your videos, your pictures, your blogs about your month, so we can also see what you go through and how you prepare. Inshallah, until the next episode where we'll be looking at more places around the world, I hope that this can be of inspiration to you. People around the world are so varied, and as Shias, we're so varied in our practices, but we share the most distinctive connection and that is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Dearest brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you. Yesterday we took you to a one restaurant. This restaurant had different parts, so we decided to show you today different parts of this restaurant. So stay tuned as we go inside this restaurant. Mm -hmm. تفضلنا عن الفرن اللي موجود وطبيعة عمله هذا الفرن معمول على الطريقة السورية يقدم في بعض المناقيش والفطائر اللحمة والجاج والكشلات والبيتزا ومأمون هاي معمول بطريقة مشان يقدم فطائر مباشرة للزبائن يعني شو مباشر الزبون بيطلب الطلب مباشرة من قدم الطلبات نحن وفي كمان فينا نقدم طلبات بكميات كبيرة لحسب ما بتطلب الزبائن مثلا كميات كبيرة بالمئات يعني حسب ما بيتطلب الزبون وفي سرعة كتير كبيرة بالنسبة للتقديم. Okay, brother is saying that this furnace is brought from Syria. It's a Syrian way of cooking different types of pizza, including meat and other other things. They do it here in front of the the those people who come to the to this restaurant to show that how they prepare and make. This type of pizzas. Also, uh, they have the ability 
to spread these pizzas outside. Uh, if someone wants to order, for example, 100 pizza, they can do it for them easily. I asked the brother about this uh, salon that we are here in uh, now. Uh, he's saying that we have opened this part of the restaurant recently uh, because the previous uh, part that they had uh, could include uh, only 125 person. Now they have this uh, part uh, ready here uh, with new decorations and with new services. Also, they have an upper part uh, which is specified for VIP. It can include about 100 person too. In this episode, we're going to talk about health tips and medical advice. Over the past few episodes, we've talked about risk factors for heart disease, for cardiovascular problems. We've talked about potential symptoms of heart attacks. And inshallah, today we'll talk about strokes. Strokes can be one of the most deadliest illnesses or diseases or problems that one person can have. If it doesn't kill you, it can cause severe problems with your quality of life. It can make you not able to walk, not able to talk, not able to swallow or eat. So it's something that we must try and avoid by keeping a good and healthy lifestyle and try and avoid risk factors that could cause it. Inshallah, today I'll be talking about potential risk factors for stroke. And we've already talked about this in the previous episodes, but I'll talk about how they can cause strokes and the pathophysiology behind it. Number two, I'll talk about what strokes are. Number three, I'll talk about treatment for stroke. Number four, I'll talk about long-term prognosis after someone's had a stroke. The pathophysiology for stroke is pretty much similar to that of a heart attack, except it happens in a different part of the body. The plaque that builds up when you have a heart attack in the coronary artery is the same thing that happens in the carotid artery, which supplies the brain. It's a large vessel in the neck. And because of high blood pressure, cholesterol, high uh, diabetes, smoking, all these can cause the buildup of a plaque in the artery that supplies the brain. And as a result, over time, this can get bigger and bigger. As the blood is supplied and is pumped out of the heart to go towards the brain, parts of this plaque can break off and head towards the brain and get lodged there. This can either manifest it itself in the form of a transient ischemic attack, or a TIA, which lasts a few seconds, or it can be a full-blown stroke. The cause for a stroke is simply not enough oxygen to specific brain cells. Or if it's a large stroke, depending on which artery is affected, it can affect more than one part of the brain. Now, strokes essentially, the symptoms you get with strokes can be from subtle things such as unable to find the right words to the more profound things such as inability to walk or losing the movement on one side of the body completely. Strokes can affect different parts of the brain, so depending on what part of the brain they affect, it will affect, obviously, the symptoms that you have. 
The most commonest symptoms though are a facial droop on one side, inability to talk or when you're slurring your speech. Other symptoms are the inability to move one side of your body or to feel one side of your body. The more subtle symptoms are things like lack of coordination. If you find that you've got any of these symptoms, I would suggest you go and see a doctor as an emergency. If you have access to a phone, dial whatever emergency number there is in your country and get seen in a hospital. The reason being is that if it's a stroke that's happened very recently, as long as it's not a hemorrhagic stroke, which I'll inshallah talk about in a, in a few minutes, then you should get to the hospital because within four hours in the UK, we can give something called thrombolysis, which dissolves the clot which causes the stroke if it's within four hours of picking it up. Hemorrhagic strokes are caused not because there's a blockage of an artery or a blood vessel, but they're caused because a blood, ve blood vessel has popped and exploded. And as a result, instead of the blood supply going to the brain cells, it just oozes out of the artery or the blood vessel, not making it all the way to the cell that it's intended to go to. As a result, people can have, number one, uh, stroke-like symptoms, and number two, if there's enough bleeding, it can cause pressure on the brain and cause someone to get drowsy and even more or worse symptoms than that. Like I said, if you get any of these symptoms, it's important that you seek urgent medical attention. Hemorrhagic strokes consist or make up about 10% of all strokes. The rest of them are all caused due to ischemia, due to a lack of the blood getting to the brain, due to the blockages that I've mentioned before. The treatment for stroke depends on person to person, depends on how extensive the stroke is. And thirdly, it depends on how quickly it's picked up. If you're at home and you found someone or you think someone's had a stroke, it's very, very important that you get them sent to hospital as soon as possible. In the hospital, they usually have a CT scan, number one, to see if there's a profound stroke that's obvious on the scan, number two, to exclude any bleeds on the brain. And after that, they usually give the patient something called, either they give them thrombolysis, if it's caught within a few hours and if the symptoms are extensive enough, or they give them medication such as antiplatelet therapy and sometimes even warfarin. Now, it's very important to realize that the antiplatelet therapy differs from country to country, so inshallah, I won't go too much into that. But it's just to say that if you're given advice by a doctor, it's very important that you stick to that advice. Once someone's been treated for stroke, the prognosis obviously depends upon the treatment they've received. It depends upon how quickly the stroke was picked up, and that will obviously affect the treatment that they received. It depends on the extensiveness of the stroke itself. And number four, it depends on the rehabilitation process. Inshallah, I'll talk through some of these things in a bit more detail. And also the long-term prognosis after many, many years and how your life will be affected. Number one, the medication is very important to stick to your medications that the GP has given you or your doctor has given you. And if you find that for whatever reason you can't tolerate it, go and see a doctor as soon as possible. Don't stop taking your medication, whatever you do. Secondly, the extent of the stroke obviously is not under your control, but it will determine the medication, the treatment that you get. And also the rehabilitation is a very, very important part of stroke recovery. The reason being that the brain has something called plasticity. It's got the ability to compensate for compromised, a compromised system. Essentially, it means that if there isn't one part of the brain working, Another part can substitute or, ha or be plastic enough to do a role which can compensate for that part of the brain that's not working. Now this depends a lot on the rehabilitation process. So if you are very, very intensive and work very, very hard in the rehabilitation phase, you can see a lot of improvement very quickly. However, this depends on person to person, like I've said. It depends on the rehabilitation process and also on your willpower as an individual. Sometimes you can try your best and still not get good results. And if that's the case, then don't be upset. It's just sometimes there's not much you can do about it when you're in that state or in that stage. But if you don't try hard enough, you'll never know. Then the long-term prognosis depends on person to person and the symptoms that you had to begin with. So, for example, if it's something as simple as lack of coordination, then these symptoms can last or can stay with you for a while, but they will or they can get better. However, people that find that they can't swallow and eat, they will need an assessment from the SALT team, which is a speech and language therapist, that will help them to firstly coordinate their swallowing. 
And secondly, they will allow them to develop the muscles and the ability to swallow if they can't do so. And obviously the speech and language therapists also help with you or help you if you're suffering from inability or slurring of your speech. The reason why it's important to assess someone who has problems swallowing is that if the muscles that allow you to swallow are not working properly, then sometimes it can mean that instead of the food going down your food pipe, it goes down your windpipe. And if that happens, it can be catastrophic because it can cause a severe pneumonia which can make you very, very ill. Other avenues one can explore when suffering a stroke are things like physiotherapy. Someone who's had a stroke on one side may find that they're not very mobile. They may find that they're in a, a, unable to walk very far. And as a result, the physiotherapists are engaged and they come and they help you out. And they also help in the rehabilitation process. They'll help you to learn how to use your muscles once again to make sure your muscles don't shrink by under use of them. They'll also try and get you to learn tips on how you can move from, for example, your bed onto a chair, how you can move and stand up from a seating position. And they'll also help you to walk using walking aids to sticks and frames. And inshallah, if the rehabilitation process is, is, is successful, they will also try and follow you up after you have been through that to see if everything's going well. The other um, professional organization that we usually explore is the occupational therapists. Some people who've had strokes find that specific parts of the brain are affected. For example, if your frontal lobe is affected and you can't do executive functioning such as cooking for yourself, then they can get to you meals, something called Meals on Wheels, or they can get meals provided for you. Number two, if it's something like a profound stroke which has affected your ability to use your hands or your feet, and you're unable to wash yourself or dress yourself, they can get carers in to try and help you to do that. Obviously, once all of this is done, it is important that you keep up to date or keep regular checkups with your doctor, because if there's any worsening of your symptoms, the doctor can refer you to another agency or the physiotherapists or the occupational therapists if needed. Inshallah, I hope that these last few episodes have been useful where we've talked about cardiovascular risks, strokes and so forth. Inshallah, I hope that this allows you to lead a more healthier lifestyle, to look after your heart, to look after your brains so that you can be of benefit to the community in the long run. Inshallah, tomorrow we'll be going on to another topic and diverting away from this short series that we've had. But Inshallah, I hope that you've learned enough from it. And as a result, you're physically more able to continue and have a good quality of life. And through that, you may be able to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Government corruption is a big problem in today's world. If we wanted to look anywhere and in any country, we cannot find a government free of corruption. Politicians operate on bribes and their, and their positions are determined by the, by the person who pays the most. Government resources, the wealth of the nation's people, are squandered left and right. However, there was one government in history where this was not the case. The government of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him the father of Hassan and Hussein. Such was the nobility of Ali ibn Abi Talib that he, was in, well, that he was incorruptible. He never wasted the resources in which were they were entrusted upon him. This was because he knew that to, uh, that to occupy a position of public leadership meant to serve the people and not rule over them. One day, Talha and Zubair, a very well-known two figures in the time of Imam Ali, came to visit him to make a deal. They were hoping that if they pledged their support to the government of the Imam, he would, he would in return grant them positions and he, he would grant them uh, high social and political positions. It was evening time when they arrived at the government buildings and greeted Imam Ali while he was working to record the funds of the treasury. He extinguished one candle and lit another. The two men were curious of this action telling the Imam that they had come to discuss some, some important matters. They asked him, although they asked him that why this weird action from him. 
Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib pointed to the extinguished candle and said, the candle that I extinguished was purchased from the public treasury. So I only use it when I when I'm working on the public treasury. And the candle that I lit is is purchased from my own pocket. And since you have come to me for personal matters, I lit that candle. When Talha and Zubair realized such a man, realized that such a man cannot be incorrupted, they would never have done the deal that they had in mind. They excused themselves and left without saying any word. Respected viewers, brothers and sisters, I would like to leave you with this quote by Ali ibn Abi Talib who says, Be sincere, for with sincerity you will reach success and become successful. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah today, I hope to recite an ashid which is about equality, about making sure the poor are fed, making sure the needy get what they need. It's an ashid which I've heard recently which has a very deep and profound meaning, although it's so simple. The title is Assalamu Alaikum. I dream, I dream for, a day, for a day when there'll be, when there'll be, there'll be no more misery when there's no more hunger no need for shelter isn't there enough to share or is it that we just don't care we're here for a day or two let me show my way salamu alaykum Salamu alaik, salamu alaikum. Salamu alaik, salamu alaik, salamu alaikum. I pray for a day when there'll be justice and unity. When we put aside our differences, fighting makes no sense. Just a little faith to make it a better place. We're here for a day or two. Let me show my way. Salamu alaik. Salamu alaik. Salamu alaikum. Salamu alaik, salamu alaik, salamu The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, O people, surely the month of God has approached you, the month which in the eyes of Allah is the most virtuous of the months. Its days are the best of days and its nights are the best of nights, and its moments the best of moments. As we conclude another episode of the Ramadan show, I want you to leave you with a few final words, something to ponder over and think over during these nights of Ramadan. And that is from a very famous Swahili proverb. And that proverb is, when you do something good, don't wait for the thank you. In other languages, it is, when you do something good, forget about it. Either way, what it means is, when you do something good, walk away from it so fast that you don't even get to hear the word thank you. 
because surely you're doing it out of the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your reward lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These worldly acknowledgements will not get you very far. Inshallah, I hope that you can join us again for another episode tomorrow. Don't forget to send in your videos, your picture, your blogs, so that we can air them on this TV channel also. Don't forget to join us on social media using the hashtag IHTVRamadan on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, and also on Instagram. Inshallah, I hope to see you tomorrow, and I'll leave you with these final words. Wassalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.